March 26th, 1993. Volume 72, Issue 6 of Cell, one of the most highly renowned scientific journals, is released. And in it, a beacon of hope for hundreds of thousands of people around the world suffering from Huntington's disease. It was in this journal that the gene identifying Huntington's disease was first published. Many thought that things would be smooth sailing from then on out, that knowing the gene would pave the way for targeted treatments and even cures for Huntington's. And this information has led to remarkable advances in our knowledge about Huntington's disease. Advances that we should be very hopeful about. But if you asked a scientist from 1993 where they thought we would be with this in 2019, I don't think this is what they would have had in mind. This is why each and every one of the efforts for Huntington's research is absolutely critical in our fight against this disease. In this episode, we are exploring one of those efforts. This is the Podcast for Hopes, the Huntington's Outreach Project for Education at Stanford. In each episode, we'll share stories that shed light on the history and current issues in Huntington's research. I'm Lauren Hinckley. In this episode, we're taking a dense but really interesting paper and breaking it down for you. I promise you won't need a PhD for this one. And hopefully, at the end, you'll have a taste for some of the research that's being done. Today, I invited Huntington's researcher, Dr. Lisa Stanick, to break down one of her papers. She works at Santa Fe, a biopharmaceutical company. My name is Lisa Stanick, and I'm a senior principal scientist at Santa Fe. Prior to joining the company, I was not doing Huntington's disease research per se. I was working in a lab uh, that looked at animal models of neurodegeneration, but it was mostly Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And when I came to the company, they were really interested in starting up a Huntington's disease research portfolio. There's a very high unmet medical need. So I just started doing research and reading and learning about the disease. Here I am 10 years later and still there is currently no cure for Huntington's disease. And although there are, uh, very excitingly, uh, there are some clinical trials. We have made a lot of progress in 10 years, which is really exciting, but there's definitely still a lot of challenges. Stanek will be talking about her HD lowering strategies in the paper she's discussing today. But before we get into her paper, here's some background. Huntington's is a neurodegenerative disease that's caused by a mutation in a single gene. Genes are used as a template that will eventually tell the cells how to make proteins. Proteins are responsible for making sure that many of the cellular functions are carried out. They're the worker bees and are used in cellular structure, enzymes, and so many more essential processes. But in between genes and proteins, there's another step the formation of something called mRNA. mRNA is a temporary copy of the DNA template, and it's what the cellular machinery actually uses to figure out how to make proteins. Without the mRNA, you can't make proteins because the DNA holding the instructions is stuck inside the nucleus. So in Huntington's disease, Mistakes in the DNA of the mutant Huntington gene are copied into the mRNA and then made into a dysfunctional protein. This mutant Huntington toxic protein is this big sticky protein that tends to aggregate or form into these clumps within the neuron or the brain cell. And unfortunately, once a lot of these clumps start to accumulate, the brain cell has a really hard time dealing with it. It really taxes the cell's machinery. The cell is unable to get rid of these 
these large protein aggregates, and eventually the cell will die. In her research, Stanek decided to target that middle step I mentioned, the mRNA. If you get rid of the temporary copy of the DNA, no mutant Huntington protein will be made. So, she hopes, the disease could essentially be cured. So the title of this paper is Silencing Mutant Huntington by Adeno-Associated Virus-Mediated RNA Interference Ameliorates Disease Manifestations in the Yak-128 Mouse Model of Huntington's Disease. <laughs> so it's, it's quite a mouthful. Let's break this down. RNA interference is a technique to get rid of that Huntington mRNA, and Stanek tested it out in a mouse model of Huntington's called Yak-128 that has some similar characteristic to human Huntington's, especially in terms of problems with movement. RNA interference, or RNAi, uses small molecules of RNA that scientists design, so that when these small molecules are put into a cell, they will signal to the cell to degrade a certain mRNA, in this case, the Huntington mRNA. It's a powerful concept, but tricky in practice. To get these um, these small RNA molecules into the cell, we actually have to um, put them into viruses. Because if you just inject it into the blood, uh, it would get degraded very quickly and it would never get to the brain. Um, we use viral vectors, and in this case, adeno-associated viral vectors, or AAVs, in order to actually um, put the RNA into the, into the neurons uh, in order to um, knock down the target. She used viruses, but more specifically, viral vectors. So how do viral vectors work? Viral vectors are unique in that we actually take viruses and we re-engineer them. We take out the, the, the viral genes that actually would make you sick. Um, and instead we replace them with, um, with genes that allow these viruses to infect cells and deliver specific cargo. Specific cargo, like the molecules needed for RNA interference. But before Stanek could even test whether the disease could be cured in mice, she had to figure out how to get the vectors into the brain. The mouse is put in a frame where their head is fixed, and then we injected mice directly into the striatum. So the striatum is a brain area that is heavily involved in motor control, and it is the area that is very severely degenerated in Huntington's disease. So we put the needle directly into the striatum, and we injected um, three microliters of the virus into each striatum. So because the brain is um, it's bilateral, so we put it into the left striatum and the right striatum, and then you know we sewed up the, the skin of the mice. It sounds like a horrific surgery, but in Dr. Stanek's experience, that isn't necessarily the case. They actually tolerate the surgery incredibly well. Okay, so now Stanix figured out how to inject these small molecules of RNA in the viral vectors into the brain. These molecules will tell the cell to degrade the Huntington's mRNA, which will prevent the protein from being made, and therefore, in theory, will stop aggregates from being formed and maybe prevent degeneration. But did it work in her mouse model? First and foremost, I wanted to see whether or not this strategy of AAV delivery of an RNAi molecule could actually lower levels of the mutant Huntington within the brain. She tested the different sequences and figured out the best one by analyzing the levels of mutant Huntington in the brain. And she found that her technique did lower the level of mutant Huntington protein. And then we wanted to see how much it would lower the Huntington. And then finally, whether or not it would have any effect on the disease pathology or um, disease progression in the mouse model. By treating with RNAi, could Stanek prevent the mice from developing Huntington's symptoms? 
First was a test of their motor abilities, called the rotorod test. Mice are put on a rotating rod and tested for how well they stay on. The mouse model for Huntington's disease is not good at this test. They're falling off quickly. They, they have a very difficult time uh, performing the task. But the wild type mice, the mice that are normal and do not have the Huntington's disease, they do great. They can stay on the rod for a really long time. It's not difficult for them. Um, but what we started to see is that the animals treated with our AAV RNAi looked almost like the wild type counterparts. Motor symptoms aren't the only reason that Yak-128 mice are good models for Huntington's. One important thing to note before we get into the nitty-gritty of the results is to understand what type of mice we're using. I actually chose to use the Yak-128 mice, which are a full-length mouse model of the disease, meaning that scientists took the entire human Huntington's gene and stuck that entire gene into the mouse genome. And what that results in is a mouse that has a fairly mild and slowly progressing disease phenotype that looks a lot closer to the human condition. You want a mouse version of Huntington's disease to be as close to the human disease as possible. Then you can test out therapies and see what will potentially work for people. What we found is that the Yak-128 Huntington's mice show a depressive-like phenotype. So if you put them in a beaker of water, all mice will swim, they try to get out, but in this case they can't get out of the beaker because it's a really large beaker of water. And so the yak mice very shortly will just give up. They stop swimming and they just start floating. Um, it's called learned helplessness and it's a marker of depression. Um, when we treat the mice with the drug, we actually show that the Yak-128 Huntington's mice start looking a lot more like wild-type mice. So wild-type mice will swim the entire duration of the test, which is about five minutes. Um, they don't give up at all, and the Huntington's mice that weren't treated, they are just floating throughout the test. So, the normal mice will swim, and the Huntington's mice will float. But when you give the Huntington's mice the drug, they start to swim too, just like the normal mice. So although it's really hard to say our mice are depressed, it is a behavioral phenotype that is showing a difference between the wild type and the Huntington's mice. And we also see an improvement in this phenotype with the AAV RNAi. And I think that's really important to note because if you talk to Huntington's patients, in addition to the severe motor symptoms that they experience, they also have very severe psychiatric concerns. So serious depression is a major symptom of Huntington's disease, and the fact that we saw the reversal of this in the mouse model is very encouraging. Then came a twist. The work we've talked about so far has been on preventing Yak-128 mouse models from developing Huntington's symptoms by using this RNAi treatment. But what happens if you give the treatment to a mouse who is already in the late stages of the disease? We decided to treat older mice, mice that already had the disease, because there's obviously prevention of onset and then there's reversal. So in, in the study in figure six, we actually wanted to see what would happen if we injected old mice that were already sick and already had Huntington's symptoms. And the fascinating thing that I really didn't expect to see is that we can actually make these mice better. So mice that already had a rotorod deficit, when we inject them with the vector and test them, let's see, it was several months later, we saw that the animals did um, improve significantly. So that suggests that if the brain cells are still there, even if they're dysfunctional, we can actually revive them and bring them back to normal functioning. A drug that can prevent the onset of symptoms and treat those already present? Is it too good to be true? 
The caveat there, so that's extremely exciting, but you have to remember that we're dealing with mice, and mice do not experience the severe amounts of neurodegeneration that a patient does. So we would never advocate that cells that are dead would come back to life. Once a cell is gone, it's gone. So obviously, in a very late stage Huntington's patient, they just don't have a lot of brain cells there. There would be nothing to inject. However, if the cells are there, but they're not doing well, they're very sick, they're, you know, full of aggregates, this particular therapeutic strategy, we believe, would be able to restore a more baseline or, you know, normal biochemical functioning. Stanick does have some cautions about interpreting the data. These studies that I described today were performed in mice, and the brain of a mouse is 1,000 times smaller than the brain of a human. So in order to translate this therapeutic strategy to a human patient, we need to scale up quite a bit. Since the publication of her mouse paper, Stanek has tested RNAi out on non-human primates, and the results were encouraging. So I think that the next steps really are to finalize the, the optimal route of delivery for getting these vectors to the Huntington's disease patient brain areas that really need it. So in addition to the striatum, Huntington's patients also have severe neurodegeneration of the cortical regions. So we want to make sure that we're choosing a route of delivery that can get the vector to both the striatum and the cortex. And that's work that's ongoing right now. It's easy to get very excited when you see um, data in an animal model, especially data that's really compelling and suggests, you know, you've cured the mice. But scientists have also been burned by that before. There's a lot of drugs that can cure Alzheimer's disease in mice or cancer in mice. Yet to date, we still don't have therapies for some of these diseases. So I think it's important to understand that this is a major step forward in Huntington's disease drug development, but appreciate that there is a ways to go between treating a mouse and treating a human patient. This podcast features Dr. Lisa Stanek. I'd like to thank the Hopes Fund in Stanford for their support. Thank you to William Durham and Catherine Heaney, to Claudia Haymack, our original podcaster, and to the Hopes team for guidance. I'm Lauren Hinckley.